Section 13 of Astounding Stories 12 December 1930 By Various This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Grey Denim by Harl Vincent Part 2 Hey, Lyro, called the dwarf to his companion. This mole is as dumb as can be. Doesn't know he's alive, hardly. And a Van Dorn. The two laughed uproariously, and Carl raged inwardly. Mole, so that's what they called wearers of the gray. He clenched his fists and rose unsteadily to his feet. Sorry, apologized his tormentor. Mustn't get sore now. It seems so funny to us, though. And listen, kid. You'll never have another chance to hear it all. So if you'll just sit down and calm yourself a bit, I'll give you an earful." Mollified, Carl listened. A marvelous tale it was, of a disgruntled scientist of the East Hemisphere, who had conquered that portion of the world with the aid of the inhabitants he had found on the outer side of the moon, of the scientist who still ruled the East, Tsar of the Continental Empire. A horrible war, in 2085, the year of his own birth, depopulated the countries of Asia, Europe, and Africa, and reduced them to subjection. There was no combating the destructive rays and chemical warfare of the Moon Men. The United Americas, still weakened from a civil war of their own, remained aloof, and for some strange reason the Tsar left them in peace, contenting himself with his conquest of practically all the rest of the world. Now it seemed the two major powers were as separate as if on different planets there being no traffic between them save by governmental sanction, and that was rarely given. It grew uncomfortably warm in the compartment as the rocket car entered the lower atmosphere, but Carl listened spellbound to the astounding revelations of the Moon Man. There came a pause in the discourse of the dwarf as a number of relays clicked furiously on the control board, and the vessel slackened its speed perceptibly. But, said Carl, thinking aloud rather than meaning to interrupt, what has all this to do with me? Why does the government of this Tsar want me?" The dwarf bent close and eyed him cautiously. "'Poor kid,' he whispered. "'It doesn't seem right that you should suffer for something that happened when you were born, something you know nothing about. But the Tsar knows best. You—' There came a stabbing pencil of light from over Carl's shoulder, and the green eyes of the dwarf went wide with horrified surprise. He clutched at his breast where the flame had contacted, then slowly collapsed in a pitiful distorted heap. Carl recoiled from the odor of putrefaction that immediately filled the compartment. He whirled to face the new danger, but saw nothing but the padded walls. Then they were in darkness, save for the blinking lights of the control board. He was thrown forward violently and the piercing screech of compressed air rushing past the vessel told him they had entered the receiving tube at their destination, and were being retarded in speed for the landing. This much he had gathered from the explanations of the now silenced dwarf. Laro, the other moon man, remained mute at the controls. His companion evidently had talked too much. The vessel had stopped, and a section of the padded rear wall of the compartment moved back to reveal a second chamber. There were three other occupants of the ship, and Carl knew now at whose hands the talkative Moon Man had met his death. One of the three, all wearers of the purple, still held the generator of the dazzling ray in his hands. He decided wisely that resistance was useless, and followed meekly when he was led from the ship. Endlessly they rode upward in a high-speed lift, dismounting finally at a pneumatic tube entrance. A special car whisked them roaring into the blackness. Then they were shot forth into the open, and Carl saw the light of the sun for the first time in many years. They were on the upper surface of a great city, Dorn, the capital of the Continental Empire. The air was filled with darting ships of all sorts and sizes, most of them being pleasure craft of the wearers of the purple. To Carl it was the sudden realization of his dreams. He was one of them. He, too, should be wearing the purple. Then his heart sank as one of his guards prodded him into action. His dream already was shattered, for they stood at the entrance to a great crystal pyramid that rose from the flat expanse of the roofs of Dorn. It was the palace of the Tsar. It seemed then that Fairyland had opened its gates to the young man in grey denim. He immediately fell under its influence when they traversed a long lane between rows of brightly colored growing things which filled the air with sweet odors. Feathered creatures fluttered about and twittered and caroled in the sheer joy of being alive. 
It was sweeter music than he had ever believed possible, or even imagined as existing. Again he forgot the menace of the imperial edict which had brought him from the other side of the world. Then rudely he was brought back to earth. He was in the presence of the mighty Tsar, and his three escorts were bowing themselves from the huge room in which the wizened monarch sat enthroned. They had finished their duties. A shriveled face, beady eyes, trembling hands with abnormally large knuckles, a cruel and determined mouth, these were the features that most impressed Karl as he stared wordlessly at this Tsar of the Eastern Hemisphere. The magnificence of the royal robe was lost on the young wearer of the grey. "'Well, well, so this is Peter Van Dorn, my beloved nephew.' The Tsar was speaking, and the chilly sarcasm in which the words were uttered belied the friendliness they otherwise might have implied. "'That's what I'm told,' replied Karl, "'though I didn't know I'm supposed to be the nephew of so great a figure as yourself.' "'Not bad, that, for a humble wearer of the grey.' "'Oh, yes, yes, indeed. Why else should I have sent for you?' "'I have wondered why, and still wonder.' "'Oh, you wonder, eh?' The Tsar inspected him carefully, and then broke into a cackle of horrible laughter. "'A Van Dorn in grey denim,' he chortled. "'A mole of the Americas.' and to think that even the Tsar has been unable to find him in all these years. Stop, bellowed Karl. I'll not have your ridicule. Come to the point now and have it over with. Kill me if you will, but tell me the story. He had seen the slender tube in the Tsar's hand. An expression of surprise, almost of admiration, flickered in the beady eyes of the Tsar and was gone. He spoke coldly. Very well, I shall explain. You, Peter, are actually my nephew. Your father, Derek Van Dorn, was my brother, he a king of Belravia, and I a poor but experienced scientist. He scorned me, and he paid, for I learned of the ancient race of the other side of the moon, the side we cannot see from the earth. I went to them, and enlisted their aid in warring upon my brother. When we returned to carry on this war I learned that I had a son. So too did Derek. But my son was born in obscurity, and Derek's son, you, Peter, in the lap of luxury. The war was short, and to me, sweet. Belravia was first to fall, and I had your father removed from this life by the vibrating death." "'You monster!' cried Karl. But the slender rod menaced him. "'A moment, my hot-headed nephew. I vowed I'd have your life, Peter. But your father had a few friends, and one of these spirited you away. So temporarily you escaped. But now I have you where I can keep that vow. You too shall die, by the vibration. But first, <laughs> I'll give you a taste of the purple, just so the going will be harder." Karl kept his temper as best he could. He thought, conscience-stricken, of old Rudolph, that good friend of his father. Then he thought of that youth he had taken from the square. "'Your son?' he asked gently. "'Has he the triangular brand?' The Tsar was taken aback. "'He has, yes. Why?' he asked. I have seen him in the Americas. He now lies wounded and in peril of his life. What do you think of that?" Karl was triumphant as the Tsar paled. "'You lie, Peter Van Dorn!' But the beady eyes saw that the young man was truthful. Sudden fury assailed the monarch of the East. A bell pealed its mellow summons, and three moon-men entered the presence. "'Quick, Taru! The radiovision! Our ambassador in the Americas!' The Tsar was on his feet, his hard features terrible in fear and anger. "'By God!' he vowed. "'I'll lay waste the Americas if harm has come to my son. And you,' turning to Karl, "'I'll reserve for you an even more terrible fate than the vibrating death.' The radiovision was wheeled in and in operation. A frightened face appeared in its disk, the Tsar's ambassador across the sea. "'Moreau! My son!' snapped the Tsar. "'Where is he?' "'Majesty, have mercy!' gasped Moreau. Paul has eluded us. He was skylarking, in the lower levels of New York. But our secret agents are combing the passages. We'll have him in twenty-four hours, I promise." The rage of the Tsar was terrible to see. Karl expected momentarily that the white flame would lay him low, for the anger of the mad ruler was directed first at Moreau, then at himself. But a quick, evil calm succeeded the storm. "'You, Peter!' he stated in tones suddenly silky, shall have that twenty-four hours, no more. 
If Moreau has not produced my son in that time, you shall be dismembered slowly. A finger, an ear, your tongue, a hand, until you reveal the whereabouts of the heir to my throne. Never, you scum! Carl was on the dais in a single bound. He had the Tsar by the throat, his fingers twisting in the flabby flesh. Might as well have it over at once. Fratricide! Murderer of my father! I'll take you with me! But it was not to be. The throne room was filled with retainers of the mad emperor. Strong hands tore him away, and he was borne struggling and fighting to the floor. A sharp pain in his forearm, a deadening of the muscles, he was powerless save for the painful ability to crawl to his knees, swaying drunkenly. A delicious languor overcame him. Nothing mattered now. He saw that a tall man in the purple had withdrawn the needle of the hypodermic, and was replacing the instrument in its case. Ever so slowly, it seemed. The Tsar was laughing. That horrible cackle. But Carl didn't care. They'd have their sport with him. Let him. Then it'd be over. Lord! If only he had been a little quicker. He'd have torn the old Tsar's windpipe from its place. My word! laughed the Tsar. The sacred word of a Van Dorn. I gave it. He'll wear the purple for a day. Take him from my sight. Carl was walking quite willingly now. The effects of the drug were altering. His muscular strength returned, but his mental state underwent a complete change. Always he'd wanted a taste of the purple. For years he'd listened to the orators of the square, to the conflicting statements of old Crassen. But now he'd see. He'd know the joys of the upper levels, the pleasure cities, perhaps for one day. But what did it matter? He found himself laughing and joking with his companion, a heavy-set wearer of the purple. They were in a luxurious apartment. Servants. Moonmen, all of them, but so efficient. They stripped him of his gray denim, discarded it contemptuously. Carl kicked the heap into a corner and laughed delightedly. His bath was waiting. Much can happen in a day. Clothed in the purple, Carl, Peter Van Dorn, he was now, expanded. Turgid emotions surged through his new being. He was a new man, in his rightful place. He was delighted with the companionship of his new friend of the purple, Leon Lemaire. An euphonious name. A fine fellow. Fool that the Tsar must be to leave him in the care of so amiable a man. Why, Leon couldn't hold him. None of them could. He'd escape them all, if he wished. Twenty-four hours, indeed. They were in the midst of a gay company. Wine flowed freely, and Leon had attached to their party a pair of beautiful damsels, young and easy to know. There was music and dancing. Lights of marvelous color played over the assemblage in the huge hall, swaying their senses at the will of some expert manipulator. Peter was a different person now. He was exhilarated to the point of intoxication, but not by the wine. Somehow he couldn't bear the taste of the amber fluid the others were imbibing with such gusto. The effects of the drug had left a coppery taste in his mouth. But no matter. Rhoda, his lovely companion at the table, leaned close. Her breath was hot at his throat. He swept her into his arms. Leon and the other girl laughed approvingly. There were many such places in the upper levels of Dorne, and they travelled from one to another. Now their party was larger, it having been augmented by the appearance of other of Leon's friends. Fine companions, these men of the purple, and the women were incomparable, especially Rhoda. They understood one another perfectly now. It was all as he had pictured it. Someone proposed that they visit the intermediate levels. It would be such a lark to watch the mechanicals. They made the drop in a lift, a laughing, riotous party, and Peter was one of them. He felt that he had known them for years. Rhoda clung to his arm and the languorous glances from under her long lashes set the blood racing madly in his veins. In the levels of the mechanicals they romped boisterously. To them the strange robots, creatures of steel and glass and copper, were objects of ridicule, poor senseless mechanisms that performed the tasks that made the wearers of the purple independent of labor. Here they saw the preparation of their synthetic food, untouched by human hands. In one chamber a group of mechanicals, soulless and brainless, engaged in the delicate chemical compounding of raw materials that went into the making of their clothing. Here was a nursery, where tiny tots born to the purple were reared to adolescence by unfeeling but efficient mechanical nurses. The mothers of the purple could not be bothered with their offspring until they had reached the age of reason. 
The whirring machinery of a huge power plant provided much amusement for the feminine members of the party. It was also massive, throbbing with energy, but dirty. Ugh! Lucky the attendants could be mechanicals. "'We have visited the lower levels,' whispered Rhoda in his ear. "'But not often. It isn't pleasant. Ignorant fools in the grey denim. Too many of them. I don't know why we permit their existence. Fools who will not learn. Education made us as we are, and they won't take it. Sullen looks and evil leers are all that they have for us. Hope nobody suggests going down there now. Me too, said Peter. He had forgotten that once he was Carl Crasson, a wearer of the despised grey. Someone in the party was becoming restless. They must move on. Where to? asked Peter. San Dalor, sweet boy, a pleasure city within a hundred kilometers of Dorne. You'll love it, Peter. A pleasure city. Fondest dream of the wearers of the gray. In the dim past, when he was Carl, he had dreamed it often. Now he was to visit one. They were atop the city now, and the crystal palace of the Tsar shimmered in the sunlight off there across the flat upper surface of Dorne. But it seemed so far away that Peter did not give it a second thought. He was living in the present. A swift arrow took them into the skies, and they roared out above the wilderness that was everywhere between the great cities of earth. Funny nobody thought of leaving the cities and exploring the jungles of the outside. But of course it wasn't necessary. They had everything they needed within the cities. All of their wants were supplied by the mechanicals and by the few toilers in the gray who still persisted in ignorance and in some perverse ideas that they must work in order to live. Besides, the jungle was dangerous. San Dolor loomed into view, a great island floating in the air a thousand meters above the tossing waters of the ocean. Peter gave not a thought to the forces that kept it suspended. Dimly he recalled certain words of old Rudolph, words regarding the artificial emanations that had been discovered as capable of counteracting the force of gravity. But his mind was intent on the pleasures to come. They were over the city. Carefully tended foliage lined its streets, and a smooth lagoon glistened in its center. Its towers and spires were decorated with gay colors. The streets were filled with wearers of the purple, and the nude bodies of bathers in the lagoon gleamed white in the strong sunlight. He sensed anew the nearness of Rhoda. Her soft warm hand nestled in his, and she responded instantly to his sudden embrace. There came a shock, and the party was stilled in dismay. The arrow careened violently, and the pilot struggled with controls that were dead. San Dolor dropped rapidly away beneath them. They were shooting skyward, drawn by some inexplicable and invisible energy from above. Rhoda screamed and held him close, trembling violently. All the women screamed and the men cursed. Leon rose to his feet and stared at Peter. The friendliness was gone from his features and he spat forth an accusation. A glistening mechanism appeared in his hand as if by magic a ray generator. He had been appointed by the Tsar to guard this upstart, and whatever happened he'd not let him escape with his life. The girl shuddered at sight of the weapon and extricated herself from his arms. Her affection, too, had been a pose. Peter's mind was clearing from the effects of the drug. He had not the slightest idea of what might have caused the quick change in the situation, but he resolved he would die fighting, if die he must. Leon fumbled with the catch of the generator. It refused to operate. The force that was drawing them upward had paralyzed all mechanisms aboard the little arrow. Flinging it from him in disgust, he sprang for Peter. Their minds befuddled, the rest of the men watched dully. The women huddled together in a corner, whimpering. They were a sorry lot after all, thought Carl. He was no longer Peter Van Dorn, and he thrilled to the joy of battle. Leon Lemaire was no mean antagonist. His flailing arms were everywhere, and a huge fist caught Carl on the side of his head and sent him reeling. But this only served to clear his mind further and to fill him with cold rage. He bored in unmercifully, and Lemaire soon was on the defensive. A blow to his midsection had him puffing, and Carl hammered in rights and lefts to the now sinister face that rocked his opponent to his heels. But the minion of the Tsar was crafty. He slid to the floor as if groggy, then with cat-like agility dove for Carl's knees, bringing him down with a crash. End of Part 2